Hello, this is Bible Academy for Children. I'm Pastor Teacher Curtis Omo, and today we continue in our Psalm series in Psalm 58. Psalm 58. Now, before we get started, let's make sure that we have confessed our known sins, according to 1 John 1, 9. At the same time, we're allowing the Holy Spirit to control us by giving ourselves over to him. Let's pray. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this opportunity and the privilege, everything you've provided so we can study your word. We ask that our hearts and our minds be open and ready to hear it. In Jesus' name, amen. This psalm is not too long, but it's a very interesting one and one that has a lot of application, especially for today. There's three characteristics about this psalm that we want to take note of. One is, not only is it a lament psalm where people cry out to God in time of need, but it's also called a national lament or communal lament, meaning uh, a group of people. Now, this is only the second one I think I've done in this entire psalm ser series. We've done several individual laments, but this would be one that the nation would cry for or a group in the uh, temple or tabernacle would cry for. They would go there and say this together, wanting some change in the nation. Now, the other characteristic of this, it's called a imprecatory. Let me spell that out for you. I M okay P R E C A T O R Y. It's called an imprecatory psalm. That's when the psalmist, in this case David, asks God to judge someone, to bring judgment on someone. A third characteristic is that it's practically prophetic. Now, I use the word practically. It's not uh, a, a prophetic psalm like we see when we study the psalms about uh, the coming Messiah. We call those messianic psalms. But David is so sure that God's going to bring justice that he expects to see justice. And in that sense, it's prophetic, but it's not a regular prophetic one. That's all I'm trying to say. So those are three of the characteristics we can keep in mind and that we will see. Now, I will tell you that this is some of the most difficult verses to translate from the original Hebrew. Now, I won't spend a lot of time on that in the, in the children's series because it's very technical. I don't think it's necessary for you to know, but I'll just tell you the results, basically. And scholars, that is Hebrew scholars, will admit they cannot solve some of these puzzling verses. It has to do with the words and phrases, and we'll, we'll talk about them a little bit when we come to them. So let's understand it's a, uh, a national lament or a group lament, sometimes called a communal lament. Now, I like to look at the outline on these because it gives us an over idea, overall idea where we're going. Now, so we have... The first part, one through five, an accusation of the judges. The psalmist is going to accuse the judges of something. Now, these judges are people who work within the nation. We'll talk about that more later. But uh, in the different tribes, remember they had tribal territories that have their own judges that would help rule. They didn't have to all travel all the way to Jerusalem. That would be uh, silly. But they had their own judges, their own rulers to make decisions. Judges and rulers are basically the same people. The judges make decisions for the people, uh, just like they did before the kings, but they do it in the tribal territories. The nation only has one king, but a lot of judges or rulers in the smaller territories. The second part of the outline, Roman numeral two, is a petition. That's a way of saying a prayer or a request for God to destroy the wicked judges. There's a lot of wicked judges, six to eight. And then 
Roman numeral three. This is a long one. Anticipating joy of the righteous, that's the righteous people, the believers, over God's vengeance on the corrupt judges. And that their own righteousness, that is of the believers, is rewardable. 9 through 11. The message, stay with me here, this sums up the psalm. After the psalmist describes the wicked and unfairness of the judges or the rulers, he petitions God to destroy them and anticipates the joy of the righteous over that vengeance and their own reward. That is their own reward that the righteous receive. So they're having to live under these corrupt rulers. But by doing the right thing, remaining righteous, they are rewarded. They can be rewarded both on earth and in eternity. Well, we begin with the superscription. That's the couple of lines we have under the verse title, excuse me, under the uh, psalm title. The superscription reads, To the director of music, according to Do Not Destroy, a Miktam of David. There's a couple of odd things here. We're familiar with the director of music. David wrote it to be given to the choir director who would lead the temple choir, Levitical choir. They still had the tabernacle during the time of David. And it's to do not destroy. Now, this probably means to the tune of. So this is a familiar song that they knew, and they would sing this psalm to the tune of that familiar song called Do Not Destroy. And we don't have that. All right? We don't have that original song. So we, And, of course, we don't have any idea what the tunes were to these psalms. Uh, they were not preserved, and that's not important. We have the words. The words of the song are always the most important of the song, even of a hymn, a hymn, because if they're not biblical, then you shouldn't be singing it or change some of the words. Then it says a miktam of David. That's another word. We don't know what that means. Now we've done a couple of psalms that say do not destroy that doesn't really help us if we still don't know what it is but there's another one that we're going to do psalm 75 so actually we've only done one we've done 57 then there's 58 which is this one and then the future one is 75 when we get to that i'd hope to get to that in the next year or two but i don't know i'm getting ready to start a very long series so we'll just have to see all right so that's the superscription and we don't learn a whole lot other than it's by David to this particular uh, tune. Now, let's get into the psalm even further. Verse 1, David begins with a couple of questions to challenge the honesty or the integrity of the judges. And then he's going to answer his own question. But let's look at the questions. He says, do you rulers really pronounce just decisions? Do you judge the sons of men, that means people, the people, mankind, fairly? So David is challenging the rulers. Now there's some discussion on the word for rulers. I'll just briefly mention, uh, we don't have uh, the precise um, confirmation of what this word is, but the best guess is it means rulers. Uh, the ESV uses gods, and I think that would be a, a sarcastic way of saying, you judges think you're a bunch of gods, but I'm just going to leave it as rulers. Everyone takes it. The rulers are not making righteous or fair decisions. That's pretty obvious. Now, remember some of these principles, young people. Unrighteous rulers rarely make just or fair decisions. They don't know how to. They often are opposed to righteousness. So they'll do just the opposite. They are so corrupt, they can't think morally straight. 
they do not know what a fair or righteous decision is. Now you say, well, how can it be that bad? Because from the very deepest part of them, they are unrighteous. They've lied all their life. In fact, David will describe them. They've been this way all their life. If they happen to make the right decision, it's probably because it's for a wrong reason. So, you know, they may make a decision. They just say, well, I can't believe he actually did that. That sounds good. But then he did it because he maybe he's, getting, he's trying to get his, uh, himself to look good in front of people. Or he'll switch it back when he gets what he wants. You see, they do that sometime. In the United States, when they're about to have an election, the corrupt rulers, they'll suddenly switch back to looking not as corrupt to get the vote. Then they go back to the corruptness afterwards. We're about to see that again in the United States. Now, we know that from our studies of the Word of God, whether it be in the Psalms or the Proverbs or even in the study of the life of David, God wants good governance, governance, governors, rulers, and justice. He calls for nations to have just rulers. And we see in the history of the Old Testament that corrupt nations, when they had bad rulers, God would punish them. They would not follow God's moral law. God has a moral law for all nations. They're supposed to follow a certain code to keep the world in a civil order. Uh, we're not always murdering people left and right. You know, I don't like him. I'm going to murder him. No, you can't do that. No nation believes in that, right? Uh, adultery, stealing, cheating. If you're going to have any kind of civilization, you've got to follow some sort of moral order. Now, some are barely moral, you might say, or some are much worse than others, let's put it that way, and some are good moral nations, they believe in marriage, not adultery, or you know, just uh, a man and a woman. Whoever wants to get together, get together. Uh, that gets out of hand, and you have chaos. But <clears throat> you have to have people being somewhat honest to keep a nation together. But there are tyrants, and they're immoral, and they will use what moral code they want to get their way. So all I'm saying is God has a moral code for the nations. Uh, I believe it was Jeremiah calls them uh, rules of nations. But basically it's the moral code. We studied this um, in God's plan of the ages, for example. I think we saw it in the survey as well. But you see it throughout scripture that God will judge nations if they do not show justice and righteousness and care for the poor, and he will judge them. But he will bless them in that they can have prosperity and freedom if they do follow the moral code. Now, people often sum up the moral code in the Ten Commandments. Well, that's fine, except uh, the idea of keeping the Sabbath it was just for the Jews, but to do not steal and do not uh, murder. Or they, they often translate it kill, but it means murder. Uh, do not, not commit adultery. Do not have you know, idol worship, that type of thing. Honor your parents. Those are all good moral principles that everyone should live by. And when you're born, you have good moral principles put in you, and your parents should reinforce them. You learn early in life, early in life, it's not a good thing to steal. It's not a good thing to cheat or lie, right? And your parents will say, don't do that. Don't say that. Don't cheat. Don't lie. Or they'll pu they should punish you to help train you. Or we're going to learn that these rulers didn't even have that. They're so bad. Now, these judges or rulers that David is describing were probably those who were under his rule. So he'd be the king of the nation, 
All right, let's draw a circle here, just a rough circle, okay? So he'd be the king of Israel. And when you look at the map of Israel, you'll see it's broken into tribes, right? You might have Ephraim, Judah, just, there are so many, Simeon. Of course, these are named after Joseph's uh, sons. Uh, excuse me, Jacob. And then you have all these 12 tribes, and they would each have their own ruler or judge over them. Well, they'd have several, okay? It's kind of like states. You live in the United States, and I'm talking about we have our governors, right? So you have your king over the nation. You had your judges. Well, these rulers, some of them were corrupt. So they'd mess up that tribe, which would contribute to messing up the nation. That simple. Well, let's go on and look at the description. In verse 2, we see how these rulers or judges think. So we get an idea how they think. No wonder they make these bad policies. Look at this. He answers his own question. Let's just look at the last one. Do you judge the sons of men fairly? No. In your hearts you devise wrongs. Your hands deal out violence on earth. Notice this. In their hearts, that's in their thinking, where they make their decisions. They think of ways to do things wrong. They dislike people who are moral so much, they'll do just the opposite. So if he did that, and he's moral, I'm going to do the opposite. We have leaders like that in our country right now. They'll do the opposite, even it'll hurt, even if it'll hurt them. That's hard to understand, isn't it? And notice what else. Your hands deal out violence on earth. They like to use violence to get their way. They will force people. Bad rulers will force people in some ways, sometimes violence, sometimes by very strict laws, sometimes throwing people in jail to get them to do their wrong thing. Don't forget this, because when you grow up, or remember this, uh, your parents or parent are having to deal with corrupt people in government right now, and we have a lot of them. They make very bad laws. They make very bad decisions. So your parents have to pay higher prices for gasoline and groceries. And uh, many other things are made more difficult to live. They don't appreciate freedom. And don't forget this, they often use violence. Uh, if you watch the news, you know that last summer, that is 2021, there was a lot of violence in the streets of the United States. Uh, for a number of reasons from different organizations. Uh, and when you get bad rulers in there, they'll support these corrupt, bad organizations, and they use violence. We may see a lot more violence pretty soon in this country. We'll just have to wait and see what happens. So we can expect that from corrupt rulers. What else? Verse 3. The wicked are estranged from the womb, they go astray from birth and speaking lies. Of course, the womb is from where the baby comes in a mother. So it says here from very first, they're estranged. That means they go astray. All right. They go astray from morality. Remember I mentioned that earlier. You're born with a moral sense, but it can go off course very early. If your parents don't support it, if you don't live in a society, uh, a country where morality is expected, people will go off on their own. And they'll go the way of the sin nature. Notice they go astray from birth and they speak lies. They start speaking lies from, ver from a very early age. Well, the Bible teaches we're all sinners. But then it also shows, and we know in life, that we're born under parents who can teach us right from wrong. If you have parents who don't know right from wrong, then they're not going to reinforce morality. And if it's big enough, 
in a community or a state or even a country, you have a corrupt nation. You have a corrupt, you have a corrupt community, a corrupt state, a corrupt nation. That means that most of the people are corrupted. And then you see that in every form of organization, business, government, the court system, entertainment. So they choose corrupt leaders. Now, if you're very old, you've heard of Hitler. Do you know the German people elected Hitler? And if you know much about history, you know how evil he was. Well, the description of corrupt leaders continues in verse 4. Listen to this. In fact, we need to put these two verses together because they only make sense if you read them both together. They have venom like the venom of a serpent, like the deaf adder that stops its ear. Now, the adder is another serpent, a name for a serpent, particular type. So that it does not hear the voice of charmers or of the cunning enchanter. Now, I don't know if you've ever seen, but it's really kind of common in some of the Asian nations, like in India, they'll have a charmer, or they'll call him an enchanter. He'll bring a basket out, and it'll have a serpent in it, and it's a viper, and it looks terribly scary because it rises up about a foot or two off the ground, and it spreads uh, the skin it has so it can look big. And the charmer will sit there and play a flute and he'll move around and the serpent will follow it like he's going to strike it. And that makes it appear like he's dancing to the flute. So they call him a charmer, like he's really doing this. The snake's just doing what it would naturally do. It's getting ready to bite. Uh, no telling how many times these, these charmers have been bitten and they're immune to the, the uh, poison. Uh, so... The idea here is that the snake, first of all, the serpent, it has venom. These wicked rulers will bite you with their venom, and they'll hurt you. This particular serpent is deaf, so that it doesn't listen to what the charmer wants him to do. He goes off on his own. It says, so that it does not hear the voice of charmers or of the cunning enchanter. So this is a way of saying these judge, these judges, these rulers don't follow the moral law. In David's case, they wouldn't follow David's decisions. They wouldn't enforce the law properly. So this is a way of describing a lying ruler who gets his way and no one puts a stop to him. He's insensitive to do what is right what is just. He will do as he pleases, lie when he wants to whoever he wants about whatever he wants. All right, so that ends the description of these wicked rulers. Next, we come to the psalmist, or in this case, David, his request that he wants God to do something about him. And this is strong stuff. So this is a petition for God to destroy the wicked rulers. He calls on God to judge them. Verse 6. O oh God, break the teeth in their mouths. Tear out the fangs of the young lions, O oh Lord. Wow. This is strong stuff. The psalmist wants God to get in there and make them toothless, right? Whatever it takes to silence them, to stop them from pronouncing their wicked and unfair judgments. He calls them lions, young lions. They're vicious. They're ready to tear into anything. They're destructive. They're killers. They're ready to tear into their prey. These wicked judges have been tearing people and their lives apart. 
So the psalmist calls on God to make them toothless, powerless. Note the violence involved. Doing what it takes to stop these people. Now, listen carefully. Let this sink in. The psalmist, in this case David, is asking God to silence these people, whatever it takes. To put this in application, if you live in a country, I'm talking about when you get older and you can vote and you have a say, to put this in application, if you have an evil ruler, like in the United States, you might have a governor that's evil, uh, people up in uh, authority, you might have local judges and sheriffs, mayors, who are just evil. They never understand what's moral, what's right, even what's best for their own people. The psalmist is calling them to be neutralized. As Christians, we should be calling on God to whatever it takes to stop these people from doing so much damage to our community, our family, our schools, our police force. We want just and fair people in office. We pray that God will get rid of those others. And if you can vote, and now I know you're a lot of you are younger and you can't, but if you can vote, then you want to make sure you do your part. Now, if you have an opportunity to witness to them about Christ, you do that, but rarely will you be able to contact them or have that opportunity. But we want them to become Christians, but we also want to stop them from doing so much damage. Some of them are anti-Christian, anti-God. Some of them like to Shut down the churches. Uh, they think Christians are enemies of the country. See, they're all messed up. Well, the description of the different ways to keep them quiet comes in the most difficult verses of this psalm. There's three of them. Seven, eight, and nine. They're kind of fun to try to figure out. Let's start with it. Here we find ways that the psalmist asks God to neutralize them. By that I mean make them ineffective in their rule. Verse 7. They must vanish like water that runs away for itself. When he aims his arrows, let them fall short. Well, let's talk about the first two. You know if you were to take a bucket of water and throw it on a rock. The water would just run right off the rock, right? Just like it goes down the sink. Because the water always sinks to the lowest level. Well, this is what he's saying. Let them be like water. Let them just disappear. Run off by themselves. Second way, when he aims his arrow, let them fall short. Now, the idea is he's out there with his bow and arrows, and he, he fires one. That would be like setting off one of his policies, one of his rules or judgments. And let them fall short. Let not it reach its intended target. And it's just commands. They must vanish. They must vanish. The next verse. They must, it carry, the command carries over. They must as a snail melt away as it moves along like the stillborn child who never sees the sun. Let's talk about the first line. I kind of like this. They must as a snail melt away as it moves along. You ever watched a snail? Uh, maybe you have a uh, an aquarium in the house with some fish and some snails in there. If you ever watch a snail move behind it, it leaves a trail. That's part of it. It leaves part of itself behind. You see this especially with slugs. You know what a slug is. You know what we used to do with slugs? We'd put salt on them because they're mostly water and they'll start to shrivel up. That's mean, isn't it? <laughs> but anyway, you can't eat them, but don't. <laughs> you can eat snails. People eat those as a special food. 
But anyway, the idea is they must, as a snail, melt away. In other words, dissolve, disappear, like a snail does uh, or a slug does. It just kind of dissolves itself. It just wants to, the idea is to have them keep dissolving. Let these bad rulers and judges keep dissolving. Now, the second one's kind of hard because it has to do with the human. Like the stillborn child who never sees the sun. This is like, don't let them even be born to do anything. But since they are born, this is like saying, make them ineffective. Make them ineffective. They never get started in their corrupt rule. Like a stillborn child, that means one that's born already he's born dead or he's not even really born alive he never gets started in life but the psalmist compares him and that was something that was hard in life to see a stillborn child but it was a reality in life because a lot of children died young in those days or in childbirth it's more rare today but the idea, again, is David's praying that God will deal with them severely. They'll melt away or die before they go any further in their bad judgments. Now, David is king. If he could have straightened out these things, he would have. But remember, if you study the life of David, he had rebellion in his own family. A couple of his sons tried to take the throne. There was another man by the name of Sheba that tried a rebellion. He was able to put them down before it got started. He sent his uh, commanders after, his military after him. He was able to stop them, but, but uh, <clears throat> Absalom had to go to war with Absalom. His other son, Adonijah, uh, his family got wind of it, uh, Bathsheba and Nathan the prophet. They got wind of it and stopped it before it started uh, to grow. So it got put to a stop too. But Absalom he had to go to war with. So David took care of the ones he could. But in the meantime, now he has rulers. And maybe he's talking about them at the time when we see this psalm too. But uh, I don't think so. We might have had a notation on it. it, it the, the superscription we saw kind of leaves it open, and that's a good thing helps us also broaden our application. Uh, when you get older, you'll be able to vote and put in office righteous leaders. Hopefully they'll stay righteous. They won't get corrupted because it's pretty corrupt wherever they go in government nowadays. But at least at the time, you make the best choice you have. And as a parent, when you grow up and become a parent, you want good school boards if you send them to public school where there's morality and justice and fairness taught and patriotism is taught correctly and you're not teaching godless material people recognize god you want that because not everybody is able to homeschool some people have to work. The father has to work. Or maybe there's a single parent situation. But the idea here is that you don't want these judges to go very far. Then we come to the most difficult verse. Before your pots can fill the thorns, God will sweep away raw and cooked meat. Well, let's just picture it this way. You're cooking outside your pot's hanging over a fireplace, and you have some thorny wood. This is saying, before your pots can feel the, th the thorns, or maybe the heat of the thorny wood, God will sweep away raw and cooked meat. It won't even get cooked or warmed up. This is another way of saying, let them stop. God stop them. This would be analogous to corrupt rulers being taken out of the way before they get started. The analogy would be before they even start to cook the meat, and they're the meat, the rulers are the meat. 
get him out of there. So the psalmist is calling for a swift and sudden judgment. The third section has to do, that's the long one, let me put it on the board again. Anticipating joy of the righteous over God's vengeance on the corrupt rulers and that their own righteousness is rewardable. That is, the righteous believers is rewardable. So this does a couple of things. The righteous believer is going to rejoice when God brings judgment or vengeance on corrupt rulers. We like to see the bad people get it, don't we? They watch those movies. You used to have a rule where always the bad guy would always lose. Then they changed the rules some years ago. Sometimes the bad guys win. They become popular. They become the hero. But that's what happens in an immoral nation, immoral Hollywood. The other half of this is that the righteous are rewarded. That is, those who live the obedient life. All right, let's go to verse 10. Let's get us set up here. Here we go. The righteous will rejoice when he sees the vengeance. Look at the second line. He will bathe his feet in the blood of the wicked. This is one of, another one of those wow verses. But let's pick it apart a little bit. The righteous will rejoice when he sees the vengeance. That's when he sees God take vengeance on the wicked. In this case, the wicked judges and rulers. Then it gets very graphic here, and it says, He will bathe his feet in the blood of the wicked. Now that's something that you picture in your mind. You might have a pot down there, and he has the blood. Or The idea is that he's sharing the victory of God when he takes vengeance on these judges and rulers. And I will tell you, as an adult, that when God gets rid of some of these evil rulers and judges in the United States, in our states, in our communities, I'll be happy about it. I'll be happy about it. Now, this is as if they go to war. Sometimes that happens, too. There's violence. If they start using violence wrongly, then good people have to stand up to evil people. Here the point is, the righteous, that is believers, who are being obedient, share in the victory, which is shown by bathing their feet in the blood of the wicked. It's their blood, the wicked's blood, not the righteous blood. And they rejoice over this. We're happy about it. We're happy about getting good leaders in and bad leaders out. Good judges in, bad judges out. Good rulers in, bad rulers out. Our final verse and the conclusion, mankind will say, surely there is a reward for the righteous. Surely there is a God who judges on the earth. So when people start to see Christians praying, calling for, and voting for good rulers to come in and bad rulers to go out, and that happens, and they start to see the benefit of good moral leadership, mankind, people on earth will say, surely there is a reward for the righteous. And there is. This is a testimony. This is a good work. There is reward for the righteous praying to God and doing what they can to get rid of evil rulers. The final line, surely there is a God who judges on earth. 
they see that God does judge. God is involved in this. And when good Christians pray, they do what they can to get good rulers back in, God will judge those people with vengeance and he'll reward the righteous. Don't ever forget that. If you can do things to make things better for your community, your state, your country, which will make things better for your family, you do what you need to do no matter what others are saying or doing. That's pretty clear. And there's reward for it. I want to close by doing two things. I want to give you a New Testament verse, 2 Timothy 4, 8, and then we're going to read our translation. Here's our 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy 4, 8. This is something Paul writes to believers. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. Why do we want, notice what it calls, notice the words here, important words. Why do we want a crown of righteousness? Because we've done the right thing. And who awards it? The righteous judge, our Lord. And what this is saying, we're going to receive that crown of righteousness from the righteous judge, our Lord Jesus Christ, when he appears. And we look forward to that. That's the day of reward. Our translation, Psalm 58. To the director of music according to Do Not Destroy, a Mictom of David. Do you rulers really pronounce just decisions? Do you judge the sons of men fairly? No, in your hearts you devise wrongs. Your hands deal out violence on earth. The wicked are estranged from the womb. They go astray from birth speaking lies. They have venom like the venom of a serpent, like the deaf adder that stops its ear, so that it does not hear the voice of charmers or of the cunning enchanter. We come to the imprecatory part. O God, break the teeth in their mouths, tear out the fangs of the young lions, O Lord. They must vanish like water that runs away for itself. When he aims his arrows, let them fall short. They must be as a snail melt away as it moves along, like the stillborn child who never sees the sun. Before your pots can fill the thorns, God will sweep away raw and cooked meat. The righteous will rejoice when he sees the vengeance. He will bathe his feet in the blood of the wicked. Mankind will say, surely there is a reward for the righteous. Surely there is a God who judges on the earth. Well, we look forward to the day that God will deal with the unrighteous judges and wicked rulers. We also look forward to his return so we can receive our reward for living the righteous life. Let's pray. Well, Heavenly Father, we thank you again for your word. It's been a challenge. There's a lot of application, not only now, but when we grow up. Help us live the righteous life and make right decisions and do righteous things. In Jesus' name, amen.